All right, so if you're still hanging in there and you're still watching these videos, I want us to take a step back from the composition and the MIDI um, technique stuff, and I want to talk about the way I've set up the session and how I'm applying EQ and reverb. Now, the thing with EQ and reverb and session setup, it's a very subjective thing. Um, there, are, I mean, There's tons of ways to set up your session. I've seen all kinds of different layouts. Uh, there are different ways to apply EQs, and there are different ways to apply reverb. So this video, uh, make sure that you, everything that I talk about and say, my way of doing it is right, but there's also other ways of doing it. So just take what I show you and build on that uh, to get to the next step or to your own method or approach of applying this stuff and setting up your session. So... Um, what I do, and this this is the way I set up my session, is just through uh, several years of trial and error until I've found a setup that I'm comfortable with and is comes second nature to me. So um, when we're talking about the session setup, a lot of it's going to be a little bit more logic specific. But all dolls do things like folders and um, all that kind of stuff. So. I have, for the strings, I have my first violin, second violin, viola, cello, and double bass all in their own folder. Now, on Logic X, or Logic <laughs> Logic 10, people would hate me if they heard me say Logic X. But in Logic 10, they introduced these uh, things called track stacks, which gave you the ability to make a folder stack or a summing stack. Uh, the main two differences between the two, a folder stack is just a basic folder. Uh, and then a summing stack is when you want everything inside the folder to be one instrument. So you could, so you could combine you know, two synths and a piano and a Rhodes or whatever and then close the stack and then press record and it would be its own instrument. Uh, I don't like using those. I know some people that do summing stacks with um, orchestral stuff. I don't preferably like it. Play around with it, see if you do. But I have all these broken up into separate folders. Um, and then I have uh, each instrument is on its own uh, play instance. Now, this is how many instruments you put on uh, one instance of play is uh, up to your computer and up to you. Um, you'll need to do the right amount of research and play around. Some computers can only handle four or five of these different instruments in one instance, and then they have to create another instruments, inst uh, instance. It all just depends on how much RAM you have and how much CPU you have and um, finding the perfect balance between those two. Um, so I have the first violin folder, second violin, viola, cello, double bass. It's all set up the same. Each one of these has its own instance. Um, okay, same thing with viola, cello, double bass. Um, now with the horns and trumpets and trombones and the um, the woodwinds, I am using a slave computer uh, and running it through Vienna Ensemble Pro uh, into my computer. So uh, unfortunately, I can't open up the instance and show you, but I have the same uh, setup on my slave as I do here. All these horns, everything in this folder is set up in one instance of contact. Um, same thing with the low brass. Everything is in one instance of contact. Um, same thing with woodwinds. Same thing with uh, the low woodwinds. Okay, and now we get down to the percussion. Uh, same thing. I have everything in this percussion folder. Um, and everything's in the same uh, instance of play. Okay. Now, when I'm showing you this stuff, it's assumed that you have a basic understanding of multi-timbral uh, um, MIDI instruments. Um, if you don't, that's outside the scope of this course, so look into that. Um, voices, I've done the same thing. Um, same thing down here. It's the same thing. That's all it is. Okay, so if we go to the mixer. All right, so I want to show you how I'm approaching using reverb. Um, I am putting the reverbs on separate aux tracks and then sending the instrument uh, to that. So I have a string reverb, a brass reverb, a woodwind reverb, a choir reverb, and a drum reverb. Um, so I am using uh, Quantum Leaps, uh, the East-West uh, spaces. Um, 
this is kind of regarded as the best budget reverb. It's I think it's $150 or something around that, um, and it's great. You have tons of different options. Um, you know, if you, I were to go in a concert hall, I could choose, you know, oh, I want the San Francisco hall. Then I come in here and I have, uh, you know, different options. I have the front reflections, the rear reflections. Uh, if I want to use the Northwest Orchestral Hall, uh, you know, I have all these different options. Uh, you have rooms, stages, plates, some weird stuff like forest, uh, caverns, swimming hall, parking garage. Um, so, I mean, this is a great reverb. I love it. A lot of people use this reverb. Um, even like really top-notch uh, composers use this reverb because it's just, it's great. Uh, it's a great reverb. So in this reverb, I have my dry, because this is on an aux track, I have my dry signal at zero um, and my wet signal turned all the way up. Um, and then th the way I do it personally, and this is how I like doing it, I like setting all the instruments at zero um, uh, gain, uh, sending to the aux, and then adjusting the fader uh, here. So if we were to solo the violin... And actually, it'd be more accurate if I were to solo all of the um, strings. So that's my own personal preference. Uh, I'd like to set all of them at unity and then just turn this up instead of having this at zero and having to deal with five different instruments, uh, separate uh, faders. Uh, so that's just my own personal preference. Uh, so if we go to the brass... So the brass is the same thing. Uh, got my wet signal turned all the way up, uh, dries all the way down. Um, and I found in most of the compositions that I do, the reverb ends up being around this level, anywhere from, you know, 10 or negative 10, negative 11, um, and down farther than that. That's just where it uh, always ends up for me. Um, all right, so then let's go to the voices. We didn't address the voices. Um, in the other tutorial videos, but let's talk about the reverb. Um, oops. And if you have a really good listening system or you have maybe headphones on, you can hear that pre-delay at work. All right, so that's that. And then um, let's listen to the drum reverb. Now this is... Um, where I have the hardest time getting uh, a good sound is with the drums. Um, so if we play that. So actually, I'm going to isolate the big drums and just play the percussion part for you. All 
All right. So um, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, the East-West uh, libraries uh, come uh, already baked in reverb. Um, they're recorded in their natural space, so they already have a little bit of reverb on it. So if even if I um, solo, I mean, uh, don't have this reverb on, you can still hear reverb. Okay, so there is reverb already on it, um, so you don't want to add too much. Uh, but the the big drums are where the reverb is especially uh, important. So what you have to watch out for uh, when you're dealing with uh, the reverb on these big uh, low drums is that the reverb isn't too long because you don't want the uh, the reverb washing out or covering up um, everything else uh, which can be really hard because the big the drums also have to be big and full but they can't be too long so let me uh, come in here and show you uh, a couple of tricks that i've done with uh, damage i do have uh, the reverb uh, going to the percussion reverb um, but uh, the real magic that i've done with the epic drums is in the instance itself so um, let me solo this. All right, so basically the way I shaped uh, the, the sound, uh, the decay, I've tried to make it where the decay dies down almost before um, the next hit. So if you listen again... So um, even if you're not using damage, uh, this concept is still applicable. Uh, but um, I played around a lot with uh, this decay right here. Actually, let me go farther back. Oops. It's too much. So you can tell when I bring the sustain up, it's a lot muddier. Yeah, so it, it's subtle, uh, but you have to play around with it. Uh, the way uh, damage is kind of mic'd, uh, when they record it, they have a close mic, a room mic, and a hall mic. So you can get in here and, and really fine tune the sound. Maybe you want that. Yeah, so that the hall is really where the reverb is coming from. Um, adjusting the wrong thing oops
Yeah, so uh, you might not be using damage. You might be using another uh, library. Uh, but the concept still applies in that you, know, you want a lot of reverb on these low drums to give this sense of size. You want to put them in a big space. But you don't want be you you don't want the reverb to be so long that it the the, the decay and the sustain and the release of that reverb is so long that it covers up um, everything else in the band and then the next drum hit. If you're the reverb on your drum is so long that the next hit is still inside of the last hit's reverb, it's not going to be as strong. Um, so. You know, and, and what I just said could be completely different for the next thing I compose. The second drum hit might need to be uh, part of the first hit's reverb. It's all dependent uh, on the piece at hand. But it is important to know that, you know, you can play around with this, you know, ADSR uh, envelope and mess with the, uh, the reverb tail a little bit. Um, if you're not too familiar with ADSR and the, the envelope of a sound, um, that is something worth reading into. Um, it's a little too um, lengthy of a discussion for this course, but uh, that the ADSR envelope can apply to a lot of different other things, not just um, reverb. It's a big component in synthesis. Uh, so if you're into synthesis at all, um, you know, ADSR is important there too. Okay, so EQ, um, with the East-West and Cinesample stuff, uh, EQing is not too important. You, they're recorded uh, kind of the way they should sound. Uh, as you can tell, I don't have a lot of EQs um, on here. I, I really like the natural sound of what comes out of the box in East-West. The next composer might do more EQ than I do. Um, I don't uh, too much, not at least for this one. I have found a lot of the times on the violins, uh, I'm bring, I'm actually doing the opposite of what's here, and I'm bringing down uh, some of the higher frequencies, which I ended up doing right here just in this frequency range is a little too shrill. Um, but I don't EQ too much uh, with the, the strings and the brass, uh, occasionally, I might, you know, add a little bit of a high frequency boost uh, somewhere in the, the the horns or the trumpets, um, especially in the horns. Uh, try to get some of that bell sound to stick out if I need to. Um, in this piece, I have a million horns playing at once, so I didn't really need to exaggerate that frequency. Uh, but if I had a solo horn line playing, I might want to add a little bit of high frequency content uh, just to bring out. Um, what I would consider kind of the nicer parting, uh, sounding part of the instrument, that higher frequency range. Um, now, one thing that I do uh, tend to do very often is uh, this uh, rolling out of uh, frequencies in the reverb channel. Um, so you can either do it, at least with spaces, you can either do it uh, in the filter section here, or you can just do it on your own. I like to do it here. I have more flexibility. Um, some people may s might say this is too extreme uh, all the way up here. Some people might have it lower. Um, this is just personal preference for this song. I find that uh, these songs with big drum hits, there's a lot of stuff going on in the very you know, in the very bottom end of the frequency spectrum. So I want to get rid of as as much stuff as I can. So I roll out a lot of frequencies in the reverbs uh, on these. Um, orchestral instruments um, and now with the drums um, I do have a good uh, bit of low end rolled out um, on the reverb channel uh, the reason being um, even though this is rolled out here the reverb that's uh, actually in the drum uh, that ADSR envelope that we were playing with that still is existent so I wanted the you know the the reverb of of the sound in the middle and kind of the upper end, but I don't want that low muddy, uh, boomy reverb or any additional uh, low reverb. And that's really um, kind of why I roll out uh, some of this reverb uh, on on all these. Um, I don't want that low uh, low part of the reverb, but I do want this part of the instrument to, instrument to sustain 
uh, a little bit. I want it to have that uh, reverb sound on it, but I don't want the, uh, the low stuff. All right, so that's all I got for you. Um, I know this was a a very broad um, introduction into some of the stuff that I do. Um, it was intermediate level and I went kind of fast, but hopefully the things that I showed you, um, you can apply to whatever doll you're using or whatever sample libraries you're using um, and will help you make uh, better uh, MIDI compositions. All right, thanks guys.